key areas where there is ever-growing demand for rail services. Thank you very much. And that concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions, and we begin with question number one from Jackson Carlow. Thank you. Presiding officer, the desperate further news from uh, Glasgow's Princess Royal Maternity Hospital last night will have shocked us all here and across Scotland. And our deepest sympathies go out to the families of the two babies who have died. For any new parents, there can be nothing, no news worse to bear. And it will have been difficult also for the many dedicated healthcare staff involved as well. In the light of these events, can I simply invite the First Minister to update the Chamber? First Minister. Well, can I thank Jackson Carlow for that opportunity. I also want to begin today by putting on record uh, my heartfelt and sincere condolences to the parents of the two babies uh, who died after contracting uh, staph aureus infection. Uh, there is also uh, a third baby who remains in neonatal intensive care and I'm sure the best wishes and the thoughts of everyone across uh, the parliament are uh, with that child, uh, their parents and wider families. Uh, our primary concern, and indeed that of the Health Board, is the safety and well-being of patients and their families at all times. Uh, the Health Board is taking all necessary steps to manage this incident and ensure patient safety. They've been in contact with affected families as well as with other families in the unit to advise them of the incident and the actions that they are taking. These actions include regular screening of the newborn children and providing information, information to patients, families and staff. Enhanced cleaning schedules have been put in place. A review of standard infection control precautions, for example, hand hygiene, cleaning of equipment, correct use of personal protective equipment is also being undertaken. And uh, lastly, the board uh, has asked Health Protection Scotland to investigate the incident and provide a report. Uh, the last thing I will say, presiding officer, and I, I would preface this by saying I am in no way trying to detract in saying this from the seriousness of the incident we are discussing today. Uh, but Staphylococcus aureus is unfortunately not an uncommon infection in people uh, in hospital, including uh, with neonatal babies. Uh, and indeed that infection can be found in around one in four people. So that makes it all the more important that hospitals have in place rigorous infection control procedures. Uh, and it is my job, the Health Secretary's job, working with the Board and Health Protection Scotland and indeed with Healthcare Environment uh, Inspectorate to ensure that that is the case. But for now, I know all of our thoughts will be with the families affected. Jackson Carlo. Minister for, for that and also in relation to the last point she made uh, completely endorse that and I'm framing my questions very much this today in the light of that understanding. We learned from the statement released by Greater Glasgow Health Board that the investigation into this case was triggered last Thursday the 24th of January. Will the First Minister say when she and the Health Secretary were first made aware by the Health Board of these cases and what specific assurances ministers have since sought? First Minister. Uh, the Health Secretary became aware of these infections, uh, I understand, on Monday uh, of this week and uh, at that point uh, asked for assurances. Uh, and of course, uh, given the previous incidents that we were discussing uh, last week, as you would expect, the Health Service, uh, the Health Secretary, uh, I beg your pardon, has been in regular contact uh, with the Health Board. Uh, there are standard procedures uh, in place, which I know have been the subject of discussion uh, over the last few days about the actions that Health Boards uh, require to take to assess and infection uh, outbreaks and the, the reporting and notification requirements uh, that they have to undertake and we're satisfied that the health board uh, in all of these cases has done that. Uh, the important thing of course is that uh, all of us ensure uh, that not just in Greater Glasgow Health Board but in all uh, health boards proper infection control procedures are in place and uh, the health secretary and her officials are taking all appropriate steps to ensure that that is the case. Jackson Carlin. Uh, turning to the wider picture, there was a report last week that across Scotland, around half of hospitals have not been inspected by the Healthcare Environment Inspectorate since it was set up a decade ago. Now, when asked about it in, during a television interview on Sunday, the Health Secretary agreed that if true, this would be unacceptable. To be clear, we do know that the Princess Royal Maternity was last inspected in 2017 and met the targets it had been set. But the question remains, is it the case, as has been reported, that around half of Scotland's hospitals have not been inspected by HEI in the last decade? And if not, irrespective of the number, what steps are being made now to ensure that they are? Well, again, let me uh, seek to give uh, Jackson Carlow and the Chamber uh, as full information on this as I possibly can. Um, 
the Healthcare Environment Inspectorate uh, was established in uh, 2009. I was Health Secretary at the time from memory. Jackson Carlow may, may have been shadow uh, health spokesperson at the time. It was asked then to undertake at least uh, one announced and one unannounced inspection of all acute hospitals across the NHS every three years. Uh, the hospitals to be subject to inspections were published at the commencement of the programme in 2009. They covered acute general hospitals, children's hospitals and maternity facilities from October 2010. The Golden Jubilee, the ambulance service and the state hospital were also included. And from 2013, uh, we rolled the programme out further to include inspections of community hospitals. Uh, inspections, as I'm sure Jackson Carlow is aware, are based on intelligence and they are uh, risk based. Uh, based on HEI inspections since 2009, uh, facilities visits have covered more than 90% of the acute and community hospital beds in NHS Scotland. Uh, since starting inspections, 259 reports on the safety and cleanliness of hospitals have been published. And in the last financial year, 16 inspection reports uh, have been published. Uh, I'll go back to a point I made a moment ago, though. It is important that uh, there is a risk-based approach taken uh, to inspections, which uh, is why I'm sure it will be the case that acute hospitals uh, are, are perhaps inspected more regularly than smaller community-based hospitals. And of course, it is up to the Healthcare Environment Inspectorate uh, to set the schedule for those inspections. And that's, uh, I'm sure, as all of us would expect. Jackson Carlow. And finally, I'd like to raise the key issue of how hospitals respond when faced with tragic incidents. Obviously, patients and families need to have confidence that when a case like this emerges, everything, everything is done to minimise the spread of infection any further. The current national guidance says that an investigation should only begin when two or more cases of the same type of bacteria are found. Now, given the concerns raised over recent weeks, does the First Minister believe that the framing of the guidance remains sufficiently robust and clear? And would she encourage health boards to examine the plans they have to see if improvements can be made? First Minister. Well, in light of these kind of incidents, uh, my starting point would the, be that we should always review uh, protocols and procedures and guidance uh, that are in place. And that will be the case uh, in these instances and health boards should always make sure uh, that they are uh, responding appropriately. Of course, the kind of guidance that uh, Jackson Carlow is referring to will be informed by expert uh, opinion and that uh, is right and proper. In terms of the procedure that's in place right now for reporting uh, infections, there is the Healthcare Infection Incident Assessment Tool, which health boards uh, are required uh, to follow, and that is followed by infection prevention and control teams or health protection teams to assess every healthcare infection incidents, and that means all outbreaks and incidents in any healthcare setting. And uh, as I think I said a moment ago, but it uh, is worth repetition, we consider that each of the cases that have been reported over the last couple of weeks have followed this procedure. Uh, the tool uh, in brief, presiding officer, has two parts. Firstly, it assesses the impact of a healthcare infection incident or outbreak on patients, on services and on public health. Uh, and secondly, it supports a single channel of infection incident outbreak assessment and information reporting, both internally within the health board area and then externally to Health Protection Scotland and the Scottish uh, Government. And that includes, uh, of course, public uh, reporting and the preparation uh, of information for the media as well. Uh, that, I think, is a, a robust procedure. Uh, I remember as Health Secretary having cause on more than one occasion to look at that and to look at board's compliance with that. Uh, but I do think it's important when we've had infection outbreaks such as those we've been speaking about that uh, we do review these procedures and if any changes uh, are considered to be required then those changes should be made. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, new figures released this week confirmed that for the first time in a decade homelessness in Scotland is rising. As a result, two days ago, Shelter declared that Scotland faces a housing emergency and that I quote the upcoming budget should be seen as an opportunity for the Scottish Government to ensure councils are properly resourced to deal with this unacceptable rise in homelessness in Scotland. Does the First Minister in all conscience really believe that a £319 million cut to local government is properly resourcing Scotland's councils. First Minister. Well, the 
Finance Secretary, of course, will uh, set out uh, his budget uh, statement later on uh, this afternoon. I, I very much hope we can uh, reach an agreement uh, that delivers a majority for that budget at five o'clock this evening. Work on that continues. I should say work on that doesn't continue with the Labour Party because we are still waiting for Labour to bring forward any credible proposals for the budget. I know to be... To be fair, Alec Rowley, I'm not sure if he's in the chamber, did bring forward proposals. He's a front bencher, but it turned out they weren't approved by the rest of the Labour Party. Uh, but on to, on to the important issue of homelessness. And uh, I uh, agree very much with Shelter's sentiments here. I think in order to provide, firstly, uh, the context, the long-term trend shows a significant decrease in the number of applications uh, for uh, the number of homelessness applications. The uh, slight rise this year follows an eight-year decline in homelessness applications, uh, and all of the evidence suggests that that is largely down to welfare changes, which both I and Richard Leonard oppose. We differ on whether or not this parliament should be responsible uh, for the welfare system. It's also important to note that these figures predate uh, the establishment of uh, the Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan, which was published in November with 70 different recommendations uh, backed by organisations like Shelter and Crisis, who were both represented on the task force that produced those recommendations. Uh, and going back to the budget point, we have also committed to a £50 million Ending Homelessness Together uh, fund and uh, committed uh, £23.5 million from that fund uh, to support uh, a transformation around rapid rehousing. So this is an issue of the utmost seriousness uh, and this government takes it extremely seriously, as will be reflected not just in our budget but in the other work that we are doing with organisations such as Shelter. Richard Leonard. Well, the First Minister is referring to a fund that's worth £50 million over five years, compared to a budget that cuts council funding by more than six times in one year alone, that same amount. And back to this Parliament, as it stands, the budget we will vote on this afternoon cuts council funding by £319 million. This is about cuts to social work to housing and homelessness support services and cuts in the number of staff to deliver them. As a result, people in need, including children in need, are falling through the cracks. In the 12 months up to September 2017, 833 households cited a lack of support from health, housing and social work services as the reason for their homelessness. This week, the government announced the figure for the year ending September 2018. Can the First Minister tell us if that figure was up or down? First Minister. Well, I'm, I'm going to guess that Richard Leonard wouldn't be asking me if it was uh, down, so uh, I, I'm sure uh, that it is uh, up. In, in, terms of, in terms of the issue that Richard Leonard, I don't have the figure to hand, I will happily uh, supply it uh, after this session. But these are important issues. In terms of the, the rise in the last year in homelessness after an eight-year decline, everybody, including uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on uh, Poverty, yeah. uh, knows that uh, that is largely down to changes in welfare, changes that I oppose but do not have the ability to influence because we don't have power in this parliament. Notwithstanding that, uh, we are taking action through the work we did through the task force and the recommendations that came from that through the Ending Homelessness Together uh, Fund to tackle homelessness and rough sleeping. And we will continue to work with organisations uh, in order to uh, deliver improvements there. But when Richard Leonard is talking about the budget, and I, I repeat again, you know, we, we're delivering in this draft budget a real terms increase to councils, but we have been prepared to listen to parties who say that that doesn't go far enough. We've simply made the point to parties that if they want us to increase money to local government, they have to come forward and tell us where that money should come from. Labour have failed uh, to do so. The Greens are the only party that have come forward and made constructive proposals. But on the budget, of course, on the budget, perhaps the most significant uh, item in the budget relating to homelessness and housing, which uh, Richard Leonard didn't mention 
is the £826 million being invested by this government to deliver new affordable housing. Uh, that fundamentally is a key part of how we tackle homelessness, by building more houses. Uh, something that previous Labour administrations weren't all that successful at, but which this government has been determined to prioritise and will continue to prioritise exactly that. Richard Leonard. Well, the facts from the government's own figures released this week are that 1,178 households found themselves homeless in Scotland in the last year as a result of a lack of support from these public services. That's a rise of 41%. 41%. First Minister, our councils have a legal duty to vulnerable people, including children. And you have a moral duty to deliver the funding that they need. By asking this parliament to vote for a budget that cuts council services by over 300 million pounds, you are failing in that duty. Order please, let's hear the question. The last time, the last time I asked the first minister about homelessness in this chamber, she told me for as long, for as long as one single person is homeless or rough sleeping in our country, we still have work to do. First Minister, your budget last year led to the first rise in homelessness in a decade and a housing emergency. Why is your response to that emergency and that rise to cut council funding this year even further? First Minister. Council funding. Council funding is increasing and Derek Mackay will set out uh, further details of that uh, later on. Um, in terms of homelessness, I stand by absolutely uh, what I said before. Homelessness and rough sleeping is not acceptable. Uh, the increase in homelessness is down to welfare cuts and changes. Everybody understands that. I believe Richard Leonard in his heart understands that uh, and if he joined with me in calling for responsibility over welfare to be held in this parliament perhaps we could do something more about that but, but notwithstanding that we continue to take action uh, through the recommendations I've spoken about through the fund I've spoken about working with organizations like shelter and crisis and with local authorities to tackle homelessness and rough sleeping we're also investing record sums in building new affordable uh, housing and our budget reflects all of that uh, I go back to this point though Richard Leonard uh, talks about the budget and makes criticisms of the budget he has failed to bring forward a single alternative budget proposal and that is simply not acceptable uh, I mentioned earlier on the Alec Rowley uh, proposal and credit to Alec Rowley at least he brought forward a proposal given he's a front bencher we assumed it was an official Labour uh, proposal but they can't even get their act together to agree with each other on the budget let alone agree with anybody else on the budget but in that proposal uh, Alec Rowley suggested that we free up more money for local government by effectively taking three percent out of every other budget except uh, health that would have included social security so taking 3% out of our own social security budget is the closest uh, that Labour came to making any budget proposal. So I'd simply say this to Richard Leonard, if he wants anybody, not just me, but anybody across the country to take Labour seriously on the budget, he really has to do more than stand up here and moan. He actually has to start bringing forward some proposals uh, because he hasn't done so, so far. Now, there are a lot of members wish to ask supplementary questions today. We'll see how many we get through. The first from Alistair Allen to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Alistair Allen. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government can do to assist the workforce of the Talk Talk call centre in Stornoway in my constituency, who have just learned that they are all to lose their jobs this summer. The First Minister will appreciate that 59 job losses leaves a very big hole in a small self-contained island economy, perhaps comparable to 1,800 job losses in Glasgow. Can I urge the Scottish Government and its agencies to do everything possible now to seek alternative options, as well as to help these workers and the wider community? First Minister. Well, can I thank Alistair Allen for raising this issue? I was very concerned to learn of the developments at Talk Talk in Stornoway uh, yesterday and the impact this will have on the employees affected, as well as on the local community and economy. And the point 
uh, that Alistair Allen makes about scale here, I think is a, a, a point uh, very well made. Our agency, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, is already in direct contact with Talk Talk, both at local and at national level, uh, and we are committed to doing everything possible to address this situation urgently in the hope of obtaining a positive outcome. Of course, in the unfortunate event of individuals facing redundancy, we stand ready to provide support through the PACE initiative, but of course, uh, our first priority is to explore all options for avoiding uh, redundancies, and I know uh, the Economy uh, Minister will be happy uh, to liaise further with Alistair Allen uh, about the action we are taking and any further action that it is considered the Scottish Government and our agencies could take. Alexander Burnett to be followed by Polly McNeill. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, now, I'm sure the First Minister will have seen last weekend's newspapers regarding the 13-year detention of Kyle Gibbon at Carstairs, where it was quoted that the Scottish Government had announced plans to hold an inquiry into why Mr Gibbon, alongside eight other people with autism or learning difficulties, have been detained in the Maxim Security Hospital. Now, a previous article in December said the Minister for Mental Health would be carrying out an inquiry into Carstairs by the end of January. So can the First Minister confirm that Kyle's case is being investigated? First Minister. Well, I will ask the Mental Health Minister uh, to correspond with the member with more detail of this. I, I would say, and I know, I hope, everybody across the chamber will understand uh, that due to patient confidentiality, it wouldn't be appropriate for me or the government to comment on individual patient cases. Uh, what I would say is this diagnosis of a behavioural disorder itself is certainly not cause for detention and there are significant safeguards where compulsory treatment is uh, necessary, including, of course, the right of appeal admission to the state hospital is based on diagnosis of mental disorder requiring treatment under conditions of special security, which can't be suitably cared for in a hospital other uh, than the state hospital. Um, the Mental Health uh, Minister pays very close attention to cases like uh, this one, and we will uh, do everything possible to ensure uh, that all rules and regulations are properly being adhered to. And I will ask uh, the Minister, as I said a moment ago, to write to the member uh, with whatever further detail it is appropriate to share with him. Pauline McNeill to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you. First Minister, over 20 homeless people have died since mid-November in Glasgow from the availability of a high-strength street valium known as street blues. It's three deaths a week. Drug users have been warned that they are dicing with death. First Minister, it is unprecedented and it presents a new problem on our streets. Last month, a drug gang was jailed for producing at least 1.6 million worth of this street Valium, but it hasn't dented the supply. Of course, the problem is not confined to Glasgow, it's in other cities in Scotland, but it is certainly biggest in Glasgow. Can the First Minister assure Parliament that there will be a considered response to looking at ensuring that people are warned about the severe dangers of this drug? But First Minister, I know that there has to be a much wider look, perhaps a multi-agency approach, to get these deadly drugs off our streets to save lives where we can. First Minister. Well, Polly McNeill raises, raises a very important issue. Uh, this is an issue that has uh, affected my own constituency uh, in the past, so I'm very well aware uh, both of the, the issues uh, underlying uh, this question, but also the impact uh, on individuals and communities. Uh, we are obviously aware of an increase uh, in street Valium uh, being implicated in deaths. Uh, it's usually when it's used in combination with opiates. Uh, there are significant harms associated with poly drug use. Uh, most drug-related deaths are of people who take more than one substance. Uh, I can tell the Chamber today that Glasgow Alcohol and Drug Partnership has already met to discuss this issue and to discuss uh, what further action can be taken to respond. Uh, they continue to promote a range of outreach activity as well as providing harm reduction information specifically on this issue of street Valium. Uh, they're implementing a treatment protocol for the management of dependence associated with the use of street Valium for those most at risk and identifying barriers to treatment through focus groups with people at risk who are not already in contact uh, with treatment services. Uh, and we will continue to work closely uh, with all alcohol and drug partnerships uh, to monitor drug trends and to make sure that public information uh, is as it should be. 
Uh, we also work closely with the police on all aspects of drug policy and enforcement, including counterfeit prescription uh, medication. Uh, so these are important issues and all agencies involved have a responsibility to ensure that the action that is being taken uh, meets the, the challenge that is posed. And I'd be very happy to ask uh, one of the health ministers, public health minister, to meet with Pauline McNeill if she wants further information uh, on the actions being taken and the discussions being uh, undertaken. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Maurice Corrie. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of reports of blue water at Buchanan and St Ambrose High Schools in Cope Ridge. She may also be aware of reports that staff have been warned eh, against speaking to parents or politicians about this issue. Can she outline what steps the Scottish Government can take to ensure a full investigation into this problem by North Lanarkshire Council and to ensure that the Council is keeping parents, families and pupils involved and informed in a fully transparent manner? First Minister. Well, Scottish Government officials have been in contact with North Lanarkshire Council about this issue and I understand uh, the concerns that are being raised. Uh, the Council has informed us that a range of measures are already being taken, uh, including replacing pipework, and uh, that's a process that the advisers uh, will be complete next month. Uh, the Council has also advised that parents and pupils have been kept informed by letter. Uh, I would say that clear communication of the issue uh, and the steps being taken to address it is clearly in everyone's best interest and I would encourage the Council to ensure uh, that that is done. Uh, I can uh, advise and assure uh, Fulton McGregor that my officials will continue to liaise with the Council and offer any appropriate support as they seek to resolve uh, this serious issue. Maurice Corrie, followed by John Mason. Uh, the First Minister may be aware of the recent outbreak of hepatitis A at St Mary's Primary School in my region, resulting in staff and pupils having to be vaccinated. The source of the outbreak is currently unknown, so what assurances can the First Minister give that measures will be taken to fully investigate this and prevent it from happening again? Well, again, this is an important and serious issue uh, to raise. Uh, vaccination has been undertaken. Uh, it's, it's either ongoing or, or completed, but that is an important step that has been taken. And obviously, investigations uh, will continue to try to identify uh, the source of this. And uh, health ministers will be uh, more than prepared to keep the member and other members who have an interest updated as more information becomes available. John Mason. Hey, thank you. I wonder if the First Minister can give any reassurance to the community in Dalmarnock about the future of the Legacy Hub, which is a fabulous facility funded by the Scottish Government, Glasgow City Council, eh, Clyde Gateway and the Lottery eh, as a legacy from the Commonwealth Games, but which, which sadly has now closed as the Trust has gone into administration. First Minister. Well, I was really uh, saddened to hear of the People's Development Trust entering administration um, and to hear about the impact this has had on the staff of the Trust uh, and indeed the local community uh, who have relied on its services. Uh, Glasgow City Council staff, I know, have met with parents affected by the closure of the nursery to discuss the options available for replacement childcare and the availability of nursery places within a two mile radius. Uh, the council is rightly leading on engagement with the administrator with the aim of ensuring that the hub can remain an important asset for the community in the future. Uh, that is fundamentally a, a matter for the administrator and for Glasgow City Council. However, we absolutely recognise the importance of the legacy hub to the people of Glasgow. So the government will remain in close contact with the council and with interested parties as the situation evolves and we will offer any support that it is appropriate for us to offer, including if it is necessary through the PACE initiative for any members of staff faced with losing their jobs. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Greens have regularly raised the issue of Scottish Government support to the arms industry and in particular to Raytheon, the third largest arms firm in the world and largest producer of guided missiles. They sell, arm, sell missiles to Saudi Arabia where they've been linked to alleged war crimes such as bombing civilians. When we raise these issues, we're often told, as, uh, as the ferret were recently in publishing a report by the Scottish Government, we're very clear that we expect the UK government to properly police the export of arms. Presiding officer, I don't expect that. I fully expect that the UK government will continue to facilitate arms sales to human rights abusers, to countries involved in war crimes and atrocities around the world. I don't think people in Scotland should be expecting that the Scottish Government will continue to back this industry. But just in the last week, my colleague Ross Greer uh, has published research showing... 
if members would like to hear this. Perhaps some of them don't care. My colleague, Mr Greer, has published research showing that, the, that Scottish Enterprise is providing bespoke services to that company to help them grow by offering advice, help accessing finance and help them access new markets. Mm -hmm. Presiding officer, what on earth is the justification for the Scottish public to be backing an industry like this to grow its business, a company with reported sales of some £22 billion in 2017? Isn't it time for the First Minister to reverse the Scottish Government's support for the arms industry? First Minister. Well, uh, firstly, I, I have not personally seen the research uh, from Ross Greer that Patrick Harvey refers to. It may be available to the government. I'm more than happy to ask uh, government officials to uh, take a look at that. Uh, what I would say, though, and I've said it before in the chamber uh, in response to previous questions Patrick Harvey has raised on this issue, is that the Scottish government uh, and our enterprise and skills agencies do not provide funding for the manufacture of munitions. Uh, that is weapons or ammunition, uh, particularly for military use. Uh, any support that we give for companies uh, like Raytheon is focused on projects for non-military uses and for business diversification. For example, uh, laser guidance component, components have a broad range of navigation uh, uses, including for landing uh, guidance for helicopters. Of course, as Patrick Harvey himself has alluded to, licenses for arms sales are provided uh, by the UK government. So we will uh, continue to provide support for firms uh, in areas like innovation, workplace efficiencies and uh, training. Uh, these firms uh, do support a large number of jobs in Scotland, but we do not and will not provide support for uh, weapons or ammunition or munitions uh, in general. Patrick Harvey. Well, yes, the, the First Minister does often use uh, the, the word diversification as a cover for this support to the arms industry. And I, and I wonder if the First Minister can tell us anything about the extent to which diversification has in fact happened. Because uh, according to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, in 2007, 97% of Raytheon's total sales were arms sales. In 2017, it was 94%. What we're seeing is not diversification, it is the opposite of diversification. And the government support uh, through account management through Scottish Enterprise is specifically to grow this business and to help them access new markets. Can the First Minister tell us anything that the Scottish Government intends to do differently in the future? And meanwhile, isn't the case overwhelming to withdraw this constant stream of support from the public purse for this company and others to grow their lethal business. First Minister. Well, in terms of uh, Raytheon, the Scottish Enterprise uh, funding to Raytheon has supported uh, a range of activity for diversification into non-military uh, and civilian markets and to help recite uh, Raytheon administrative staff. It is not uh, funding to support uh, munitions, ammunition uh, or weapons and that remains the case. There are jobs supported by these companies. Of course, these are uh, often global companies that don't just operate uh, in Scotland so their overall uh, business will depend uh, on what they do in a range of, of different countries. But that is the focus focus of support uh, for Scottish Enterprise. I you know, remain open uh, to hearing concerns about this, to looking uh, at whether there are any changes to the procedures that Scottish Enterprise uh, uses to tighten uh, that up. But I, I don't make an apology for our enterprise agencies trying to support our economy uh, and to support jobs. Often uh, in this chamber, uh, members rightly understandably raise concerns about job losses. The job of the government and the job of Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise is to try to create employment and support employment but Patrick Harvey is right. It's important that that is done ethically and morally. And that is what uh, Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands, Highlands and Islands Enterprise does. Uh, and we will continue to listen to views on this. Uh, and if there are changes that we can make, we're happy to consider them. Willie, question number four, Willie Rennie. Vulnerable disabled school children are being physically and mentally harmed by restraint practices in Scottish schools that may be illegal. This is the conclusion of a report by the Children's Commissioner. Over 2,600 incidents were recorded in just one year. 2,600 doesn't sound like a last resort to me. The Scottish Government has until the end of today to respond to this report. What will the Government say? First Minister. 
Well, we will respond uh, to the Commissioner's report. Uh, I believe that will be done by the end of this week, which is within the, the time that we are required to do it. We will respond to the Commissioner. Uh, I think it is courteous that we do that. But the guidance that is in place uh, already, and of course we will look to make changes if that is required, uh, is very clear about the importance of de-escalation uh, in situations where restraint may be considered uh, and that restraint must only ever be used uh, in cases of absolute uh, last resort. That is exceptionally important uh, and we will, uh, however, uh, respond to the Commissioner and uh, look to make changes to guidance or to uh, practice if that is considered to be appropriate and necessary. Last week, the First Minister told me to wait and see what she was going to do on the UN demands on the age of criminal responsibility. This morning, her MSPs voted to reject them. So I think it's fair to question the First Minister and her commitment to children's rights rather than to wait and see. A child with a mental age of three was left traumatised and distraught after being locked in a school cloakroom. There are reports of children being tied to chairs, prevented from going to the toilet, and being dragged across the floor, causing injury. These children's voices are often not heard, so it is important for us to speak up for them. The Children's Commissioner said the government is not complying with the advice from the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. The Commissioner said that guidance is inconsistent and ambiguous and he is not certain that restraint is used as a last resort. So will she take the advice of the Children's Commissioner and dramatically cut the use of restraint on vulnerable, disabled children in Scotland? First Minister. Well, firstly, I'd say to Willie Rennie, there's probably never or certainly rarely a week goes by when I don't personally and very directly listen to the voices of children uh, and young people. It's a very important part of the job that I do and it's a very important part of uh, how this government conducts itself. We uh, meet as a full cabinet once a year with the uh, Scottish Children's Parliament and the, the Youth Parliament uh, just as one symbolic example of our commitment to hearing uh, young people's voices. Yes, of course we will respond to the Commissioner and uh, if there is a view that change Changes are required we will make those changes um, and we will continue to take whatever action is necessary uh, to support uh, a system overall in Scotland not just in the cases uh, that Willie Rennie is citing here but generally in Scotland uh, that is respectful of children's rights and puts children's interests uh, at the very heart of everything that we do of course we have given a commitment uh, to incorporating uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child into domestic law uh, and that will require a, a whole range of work to be taken uh, no doubt across the Scottish Government to ensure that we are fully compliant with that. That's an important indication of how seriously we take these issues uh, and where we fall short, uh, as all governments will from time to time, uh, then what is important is that we recognise that and we take the action to rectify it and that is the commitment that I have uh, personally as First Minister and it's a commitment that runs right through our entire government. I'm not sure what, how much time we have but I'll try to squeeze a couple of supplementaries in. Liam Kerr Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of reports this week about a dental student who was convicted of serious sexual abuse against a child but was given an absolute discharge, which has devastated the family. I know the First Minister cannot comment on individual cases, but does the First Minister agree with me that serious sexual offences against children should be punished severely and that we need to see more transparency around sentencing such as this? First Minister. Well... In general terms, of course, I agree with the sentiment of, of that question. Um, in terms of this particular case, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the member for acknowledging that I cannot comment on the detail. Uh, I absolutely understand the concerns that have been expressed about what has been reported about this sentence, but the sentencing decision in any criminal case is entirely a matter for the judge. Uh, the judiciary acts entirely independently on the basis of the facts and circumstances of individual cases. Uh, they will take into account a wide range of factors, uh, including the age of the offender and any previous convictions. Um, it may be that the member is genuinely not aware of this because I think it happened only uh, shortly before First Minister's questions but the court has issued uh, a statement this morning uh, providing more detail on the factors behind 
uh, this particular case. I won't go into the detail of that. It will be available uh, for uh, members uh, to read. But it does, uh, in the closing paragraph, uh, describe uh, the decision in this case as uh, wholly exceptional. Um, and uh, I think that is, is undoubtedly a, a fair description. So I understand the concerns, uh, but we must protect the principle in this country uh, that sentencing decisions are not a matter for politicians, however controversial yeah. uh, and difficult they can be for the public. Sentencing decisions are rightly and properly matters for judges. Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister to update Parliament on the ongoing uh, teacher pay negotiations and what the current offer would mean for those on the lowest pay grades? First Minister. Well, of course, the uh, teacher's pay ballot, I know, opens today, so this is an issue that is very much in the hands of teachers. Uh, however, an, an improved uh, offer has been made to teachers and uh, the additional investment required to fund that offer, of course, will be provided uh, by the Scottish Government. Uh, for all teachers on the main grade, this deal uh, will involve uh, an increase of 9% by April this year, with another 3% in April next year. Uh, for the lowest paid teachers, uh, they will see uh, an increase in their salaries by 16% uh, by April this year and almost 20% by April next year, which is important because we know one of our challenges is attracting more people into the teaching profession, and I hope that that will help us to do so. Uh, teachers at the top of the pay scale will also see their pay uh, rise to more than £41,000 by April next year. Uh, and lastly, the restructuring of the pay scale means that teachers will reach the top of the scale faster uh, within five years. It is, of course, now for teachers decide, to decide, uh, but I hope teachers will look at the detail of this offer, and I very much hope they will decide to back this deal, because I believe it's in the interest of the teaching profession, and it's in the interest of pupils, the length and breadth of the country. Question number five, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government provides to mountain rescue services. First Minister. Uh, Scottish Government provides annual grant funding of more than £300,000 to Scottish Mountain Rescue to help all 28 volunteer mountain rescue teams carry out their work. Uh, we are the only government in the UK to fund mountain rescue in this way. We're also contributing £100,000 over three years from 2016-17 to help towards the cost of replacing the Scottish Mountain Rescue team's ageing VHF radio equipment, as well as assisting them with the procurement process. Scottish Government officials also work collaboratively with Police Scotland, the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency and Scottish Mountain Rescue to help resolve any issues around search and rescue which arise from time to time. Gail Ross. I thank the First Minister for that answer. As we now see harsher weather conditions across the country, uh, will the First Minister go into further detail on the ongoing dialogue between the Scottish Government, the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency and Police Scotland in relation to helicopter support? And does the First Minister agree with me that the voluntary work of the Scottish Mountain Rescue Service is absolutely invaluable? First Minister. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Mountain Rescue volunteers, including, of course, the cave and dog teams, do a vital job, often putting their own uh, lives at risk, uh, and I'm sure we would all want to take the opportunity to thank them for that. Uh, there has, of course, been recent uh, concern around search and rescue helicopter uh, support. Uh, the levers for change around that remain with the UK Government uh, and Department for Transport. However, following recent discussions between Police Scotland and the Coast Guard Agency, we understand that guidance has been updated to help address the issues raised around support for body recovery and for lifting volunteers from the hill following a rescue. Uh, Police Scotland's helicopter has also been introduced as a last resort to assist mountain rescue teams with body recovery to help improve the situation. Uh, and I understand that uh, the chief pilots of both Presswick and Inverness air crews met with the four independent mountain rescue teams just before Christmas to discuss how they can better work together going forward. Question number six, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, presenting officer, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to address the risk of young people being exposed to harmful content on social media. First Minister. Internet safety regulation and legislation is a reserved matter. However, we're taking action where we can to keep young people safe online 
not least by working with Education Scotland to ensure that internet safety has been embedded into Curriculum for Excellence and the School Inspection Quality Framework. Uh, we published a national action plan on internet safety for children and young people and are working with the police, education and third sector partners to consider new and emerging risks. In particular, we recently commissioned a study into the reported worsening mental well-being of young people, fo focusing specifically on teenage girls. Uh, the results of that study will be published shortly and will include analysis of the role of technology and social media. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? Um, and I'm sure the First Minister will have seen there is clear will from the UK government and elsewhere to ensure that social media companies are held to account to protect children and young people from harmful content, the shocking uh, implications of which have been made all too stark uh, in, in, with recent events. And would the First Minister agree with me that, but as well as ensuring that social media companies take their responsibilities seriously, it's equally important that we educate children early about the risks and realities of using social media and what to do when problems arise. And with that in mind, can she also tell me what action the Scottish Government will take to promote this approach? First Minister. Well, I think I covered in my uh, original answer some of the action that we are taking to ensure that internet safety is embedded into the school curriculum, uh, because I agree with the point that education uh, here is vital. I think we all want uh, to have a situation where young people can enjoy and take advantages of the enormous benefits of the internet, um, but also to make sure that they are safe. That is often a difficult balance to strike, and everybody has to play their part in that. Uh, the internet social media providers have a key responsibility here and I agree it is vital that they are properly held to account. They're in a very powerful and privileged position and their responsibilities uh, must be taken by them very seriously. Uh, but education helps to empower young people into themselves knowing and understanding uh, the risks and therefore being able to avoid the risks. So to conclude where I started, the importance of embedding this into education and the school inspection framework is essential and that is work that the government is committed to continuing to take forward. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Joanne Lamond. On a point of order, last week, uh, presiding officer, this parliament, including the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, agreed unanimously to support the urgent progress on the Glasgow Airport Access Project. The Cabinet Secretary, in taking that decision by this parliament unanimously forward, has now announced his decision that this project should be scrapped. Can a presiding officer advise the chamber how we ensure that Cabinet Secretaries enforce the decisions of this Parliament, not entirely ignore them, and announce to this Parliament at very short notice a decision which is in direct contradiction to the decision taken only last week by this Parliament on a very important project. I thank Joanne uh, Lamin for uh, asking that question. However, it's not a point of order. It sounds like a political question to be raised either through the normal mechanisms, written questions, or through the business manager and through the business bureau. Could I also just say to all members, apologies, 12 members uh, didn't get in today to ask supplementary. So again, could I implore all members and the First Minister to keep the answers and the questions short. We're going to move on now to, first, to members' business. In the name of Ian Gray on the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Tapping All Our Talents 2018 Progress Report, on women in STEM. But before we do so, we're going to suspend very shortly to allow the gallery to change round and for ministers and members to change seats. A short suspension. <laughs>